We get super excited about a business um, that has customers come back. So not just on a subscription model, has them come back at any point. We even look at businesses where there's no real reason for them to come back, but they come back after seven months. And there's no real reason because the products, they don't deteriorate, the products are good. But we just saw uh, a strange time frame that customers like to come back, not six, not 12 months, but seven months in. And so these for us are great signs that that business has found a great product market fit, has found a community that people uh, of people that love the product. And that's for us the number one thing. Welcome to the e-commerce podcast with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. Now, the e-commerce podcast is a podcast all about helping you deliver e-commerce well and to help us do just that. I am chatting with today's guest, Fabio Savi from Ever Stores about the art and science of acquiring Shopify businesses. Who knew there was both an art and a science to this, but that's what we're gonna get into. Uh, but before Fabio and I dive into our conversation, let me share with you uh, a previous podcast pick or two, <laughs> which is not easy to say. Uh, so check out um, How to Grow Your Business Through Acquisition with Steven Sphere. Uh, that was a great, uh, Steven Sphere, Steven Spear, not Sphere, uh, and how the mergers and acquisitions landscape is changing and what that means for you. A recent episode recorded with Ben Leonard. Check both those out because they're just going to add to today's conversation. And you can access our podcast picks and our entire podcast archive for free on our website, ecommercepodcast.com. Net. Plus, if you sign up for our newsletter, we'll send you links to our podcast pick along with notes and links from today's show with Fabio. They get delivered straight to your inbox, all at no cost to you, which is pretty amazing. Now, sponsor section, it says on my notes. <laughs> Let's do the show sponsor. Are you struggling to grow your e-commerce business? Do you feel like you're constantly spinning your wheels, trying to figure out what to focus on next? Well, let me tell you, I have been there. Oh yes, I have, and I know how frustrating that can be. And that's why I am super excited about the e-commerce cohort which sponsors this show, something that me and the team have put together and we just love it. Now, e-commerce cohort helps uh, businesses like yours to deliver an exceptional customer experience that drives results and to help you get started. I am super excited to announce a new resource it says brand new resource in my notes, but actually it's not brand new. It's a few weeks old now, uh, but you can get access to this new resource uh, called e-commerce cycles. Now e-commerce cycles is a mini course which walks you through the proven framework we use for building a successful e-commerce business. It's what we go through in cohort uh, in some depth. So I'm going to show you the specific steps we take in our own e-commerce business and how you can see uh, and how you can put these to practice uh, in your own business. And the good news is, of course, this is completely free. Yes, it is all free totally free, no email required. You can access that at ecommercecycles.com. Hopefully that's going to help you. Head over to ecommercecycles.com to access this free training and get started today. It is time to start delivering e-commerce well to your customers with the help of the fabulous e-commerce cohort. Oh yes. Okay. Now, if you are a regular to the show, uh, you will know that we've had on the e-commerce podcast before folks who can help you sell your e-commerce business. Like recently, we had Ben Leonard, uh, who I mentioned at the start. We've had uh, Brad Whalen way back uh, talking about how to do uh, how to sell your business. We did an episode with Stephen Spear about how to buy e-commerce businesses as well, like how to sort of grow your business through acquisition. And these are all great episodes that I really, really enjoyed. But the common thread amongst those is these are all me chatting with people who help you either buy or sell businesses. But today is a little bit different. We have Fabio Savi on the show who specializes in actually buying e-commerce businesses. Yes, today we are talking to the buyer. Now, Fabio is the rockstar ex-banker who's now leading the acquisitions team at Everstores. With lightning fast turnaround times, Fabio and his team can snag Shopify stores in just a few 
weeks. And with a data-driven approach to every aspect of the process, from acquisition to due diligence to operations, there is no doubt that Fabio and his team are the true rock stars of the industry. That's what we're gonna find out. Plus, with some of the smartest data scientists and machine learning engineers in the game, uh, they the process is guaranteed to be both smooth and transparent, which I'm really, really curious about. Fabio, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you. How are you doing? Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How about you? Yeah, doing super well. Uh, we were joking before we hit the record button that is today is one of those rare days, ladies and gentlemen, where it is in fact sunny here in Liverpool, England, where I'm recording the podcast from. So sunny, in fact, that the sun streaming through the window keeps turning off the camera because it overheats. It's never happened before. Uh, so I'm not quite, I'm, I'm quite a lost uh, as to what's going on, but yes. That's where we're at. So if you are watching the YouTube video, my screen goes blank. It's okay. I'm still here. You'll still be able to hear me. We'll make it work somehow. Um, but yeah, I'm good. Now you're in Berlin, right? So I'm in Liverpool. You're in not so sunny Berlin. Yeah, I used to be based in London. Um, I mean, the weather is not much better, but Berlin <laughs> winters are, are, qu are kind of bleak. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's kind of the impression that I get. But I think the summers are better, aren't they, uh, in Berlin yes. than in London. So you kind of get, you know, you're given with one hand, taken with the other. That's OK. Exactly. That's OK. Now, Fabia, I mentioned it in the bio, right? And it's also on the Everstores website. And I want to dive into this pretty much straight away. There is a pretty bold promise uh, on the website right there in the header section. And it says, we'll buy your Shopify store whenever you're ready. Cash out in weeks instead of months. Now, the reason I'm drawing everyone's attention to this is because I've sold businesses uh, over the years. Quite a, well, I say quite a few. I've sold a few businesses over the years. And if I'm honest with you, Fabio, every time I sell a business, an e-commerce business, the process has taken months and not weeks with one exception. And this was a business I sold in 2002. <laughs> this is a long old time ago, uh, but it has taken months. So I'm a little bit skeptical when someone tells me it can be done in weeks. So before we get into the mechanics of buying a business, I just wanted to ask straight away, is this a true statement? And can, can we talk about how you actually do that? Of course. I mean, long story short, yes, it's a true statement. The fastest deal we've ever done was around three and a half weeks. Um, so it really, really depends a bit on the merchant. And I guess that's that's also the beauty of the Eversource model. As you hinted on before, we have a bunch of very smart data scientists, data engineers, mm. and they take whatever manual work that had to be done in those acquisition processes and they kind of remove that. The only barrier to really doing a deal in two, uh, two weeks, three weeks, most of the time, is that the merchant needs to prepare the data. So if there's a right. merchant that uh, has prepared their PL, has some accounting statements, they have an updated inventory valuation, there's really no hurdle from our side as to why we can't uh, finish the deal within two, three weeks, right? Now, you're right, most of the time that we do deals, they end up closing within three and a half, four and a half weeks, uh, but still enough for us to measure in weeks rather than in months. That, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty insane. So, and I, I, I mean, Knowing a little bit, I suppose, about, about the industry, I can see what you're talking about when you say, actually, the reason it takes so long is because of the merchants getting information ready. And yes, I have to get P&Ls ready. I have to get contracts and all, all kinds of stuff, which, you know, in, uh, in due diligence terms, you're going to have to sort of um, create. So how do, you, how do you, if that's on the basis of me, surely that impacts you as a business or is there something else that you're doing with your clever data scientists because they're not making me work faster right so um is there something else that you're doing that's extracting that data from me in perhaps an easier and smarter way of course so when we think around the p l and what line items we have to audit before we can make an investment um the two biggest ones are revenue and ad spend of course but then also mm -hmm. you look at your cogs you look at your f and d so it's your cost of goods sold and your fulfillment and delivery costs. Um, out of those, the revenue and the ad spend, we have we can pull them as a single source of truth because the revenue we pull directly from Shopify, we do our own adjustments to it, but that's there is no real debate about it. That's the revenue that the store has done. In terms of ad spend, we connect to all the ad accounts that the merchants run. So we have pretty much verifiable data there that these are correct as well. 
So that right. means that our two week DD phase only really has to delve into COGS and FND. And for those, we have pretty simple methodologies and we really just look at what the latest unit economics were like, right? Um, so, I mean, that's the financial part. Of course, there's also legal due diligence that has to be done um, and that kind of stuff, which, which sometimes takes a little bit longer. But in terms of financial due diligence, which oftentimes really affects the price, um, mm -hmm. we're very, very fast in that because a lot of it gets pulled directly um, from the apps. Well, that's quite interesting because I think one of the big things that, um, <clears throat> that you're addressing here, which I'm, I'm really intrigued by, I'm not going to lie, is the fact that you're you're hitting head on, I think one of the key reasons people don't think about selling their business is because um, people are put off by phrases like due diligence. And um, I've got to, you know, I don't know if I'm going to sell the business, but I've got to let this stranger know everything about my business. I've got to go speak to my accountant. I've got to go speak to my lawyers. I'm out five grand, 10 grand before we even got anywhere because, of, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to everybody. So what you're saying is, and I'm surprised, actually, that um, in some respects, you're the first person on the show to talk about this. And I'm surprised in some respects it's taken this long. You plug straight into the Shopify site and you extract the vast majority of this data straight away, which gives you a fairly reasonable valuation, I would have thought, um, subject to everything else, obviously. But it's without costing anybody anything, um, you can quite quickly decide whether or not you and the merchant are on the same page. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think even more so in your first point, yes, one item is costs, right? You need to go to the accountants, you need to go to the lawyers, but even more importantly is the attention, right? If you're running a brand, it's taking up all of your attention. And now you mm. also have to divert for a sale that might not even happen anyways, right? And so what I think is a nice thing, whatever source is that what you said rings true. It's when merchants are a little bit iffy about if they want to do a deal or not, their entire time till they receive evaluation, their input, it's 10 minutes. It takes us 42 hours to 72 hours to give them evaluation slash an offer. Um, sorry, 48 to 72 hours. But the, the merchant is done within 10 minutes. So mm. before they ever have to put in a ton of work into getting the legal documentation out, into verifying their COGS and their FND, they will know if we're more or less, as you said, on the same page in terms of valuation and offer. And so that makes sure that they only really put in effort towards something uh, if they know that deal is going to happen. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating. Really fascinating. So, and I'm guessing this is why um, in the title of the, we talk about the art and science for acquiring Shopify businesses. And I, I take it from your point of view, you are working with Shopify merchants because you can plug into that system fairly easily and extract the data. Is that right? Do you, do you sort of meander outside of Shopify or are you like, no, we're just Shopify all the way, man? You're 100% right. So Shopify for two reasons. One is because it's just simply um, incredibly easy to short, uh, start a Shopify store uh, mm -hmm. for merchants and also for us to plug in and, and get the data. But the second is that we're incredib uh, incredibly bullish on Shopify. So on Shopify, you own the customer data. You actually own the customer, whereas on Amazon, you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot more intricacies that come at play in Shopify that make an inside out valuation system much more worth it than, for example, doing that on an Amazon store. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I, I, I <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because if up until COVID, well, I'd say up until recently, um, there was this sort of mass explosion of aggregators who would just come and buy, specifically Amazon stores, actually. Um, and uh, the value of online businesses went up because of COVID. It's then fallen down again because the cost of goods became so high and so complex just trying to get the stuff to fulfill the orders cost of living crisis interest rates increase and it seems like aggregators in some respects have almost fallen off the edge of a planet they've just sort of shrunk in and, and no one's really talking about buying anything anymore uh, would you I, I suppose my first question to you is would you call yourself an aggregator in its traditional sense or is your model a little bit different so it's a great question. So we ourselves don't like to think of ourselves as an aggregator. Mm -hmm. We like to think of ourselves as more of a technology company that's currently applying the technology to acquiring uh, Shopify stores. And I think probably best to give a little bit of color into how Eversource actually got started uh, and to what we're pivoting towards. So initially Eversource was founded upon the idea that there's this big mismatch between, as you said, the amount of stores that exist on Shopify and the amount of stores on Shopify that actually get to exit. Um, 
And we, we like to call it the long tail. So it's where most merchants are located doing a few hundred thousand dollars a year in sales to a few million. Um, but they're still deceptively far away from like a very reliable exit. Yeah. And so when we started acquiring and operating those stores, and especially integrating the stores, we realized that um, the tech stack of each of these stores was completely different. Yeah, they may have used the same two, three apps for email, like Clavio, MailChimp, et cetera. But to check on their 3PL, to check on their ad health accounts, they use completely different apps. And so yeah. the immediately first thing that we started doing when we acquired these brands was to integrate our own operating system. So mm -hmm. instead of having 80 different dashboards to check what's happening <laughs> in your Shopify store, we made it possible uh, internally to drive from one cockpit, have one dashboard that tells you which decisions you need to make. And the future of Everstores is to also release tech technology. So not just be able to apply to acquire Shopify stores, but also for merchants that might not be interested in selling, but might be interested to run it from one cockpit rather than 12. Yeah. Well, that's really, I, I can see where you're going with the software development. Uh, and that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So you're bringing these companies in, you're, you're whacking them on the same um, platform. But to sort of come back to my original question, you're not, an, you're, you're not considering yourself as an, an aggregator, but like a, a tech car like this, the, the, the tech phrase. Aggregators, I think, have had a bit of a bad rap, haven't they? So I can see why you're distancing yourself from them. Um, <laughs> so can I ask, the dashboard then, you're bringing all the companies onto your system. Um, what are some of the things, I'm really curious here, Fabio, uh, what are some of the things that you guys see common in e-commerce businesses that they're not measuring, that you measure on your dashboard because you guys think it's important if such a thing exists, if you follow my question? Of course. Yeah, I, I think given a concrete example of a KPI, for example, is that everyone always you know, fusses about CLTV CAC or LTV CAC, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's quite generally understood that in e-com, that's not the best metric to track because uh, you always reach the end of your e-commerce store before the theoretical lifetime of that customer, mm -hmm. right? It's because cash is just king. And so yeah. we have our own proxies to evaluate that. And we have actually completely relative CLTVs on like the time period per store, right? We're not going to measure the same CLTV methodology wise for uh, a subscription store that sells dog poop bags versus one that sells uh, mattresses, right? And so mm -hmm. we, it's, it's less about completely reinventing the wheel. It's more about making small adjustments to commonly known metrics to make them more accurate towards applying them in D2C. And I think that's, that's, you know, CLTV CAC is one in terms of ad creatives and how we measure those. It's another, we're able to, to quickly refresh ad creative sets rather than just do the manual work and think about which sets really going to work. We're able to generate quite a few and then have the manual input on which ones we should test. And I think that that's the nice power of the dashboard is that it allows the humans to make better driven decisions, but it doesn't mm -hmm. make the decisions for them. Okay. So you're, um, you're, I mean, your example there of the, sorry, was it a doggy bag? Um, which is a company I think you, you acquired, right? A, a sustainable yeah. dog bag company versus, um, a mat did you, have you ever acquired a mattress company? I'm kind of curious. So we're, we're, we're always looking, uh, I think mattresses are a bit difficult to acquire just purely given like the size, uh, mm -hmm. we have a few weighted blanket stores. So ones that weigh like very premium weighted blankets. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I mean, comparing it there also holds still true, right? You, you don't have the same kind of customer turnaround cycle, uh, for, for, for weighted blankets. So I'm, I'm as a, as someone who is looking to, um, acquire businesses then, um, you see, if someone came to me and they said, Matt, you know, you what kind of e-commerce business would you buy? This is just how my brain works, Fabio. I'd be like, right, I have done well in beauty. I've done it well in health supplements. Um, and we we do well for our clients who operate in industry where they are selling a small product that is a repeatable purchase. Right. So um, beauty would classically fit into that. It's a small product. I can put it in a small box and they buy it from me today. They're probably going to buy it from me in two months time if I do customer service well. Um, health supplements fulfills that. Pharmaceuticals fulfills that. And a bunch of, you know, when I think back over the coaching work, the client work we've done, um, power tool companies, you know, in some respects, they they don't order every month, but 
um, you've got a power tool and you know they were buying stuff for their power tools every month. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, so we've done really well in those sorts of industries. So if you came to me and said, Matt, what kind of business would you buy? I'd be like, I am looking for an e-commerce business that has a small product that is a repeatable purchase. I'm going to do well there. Um, so do you then, as someone who buys companies, have that sort of tightness of company that you're looking for? Or are you just literally looking at everything and you're not going, we're not going to be, we're not going to focus in on those kind of specifics, but we're going to focus more on your dashboard and the metrics from the dashboard. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So we have a few different verticals that we really love. So we love, as you said, I mean, you said beauty, which is interesting because it's actually not one of ours. Uh, and I'll get into that reason a little bit later, but we love pets. We love mm -hmm. mother and baby. We love mental health, well-being, stuff like this. Um, that's not to say that we don't play anywhere outside. Right? We have like a gaming brand, for example. Uh, and we're looking at some toys brands now. It's more about saying that we love those sectors. Mm -hmm. We actively want to get engaged in those sectors. So then we can start maybe cross-pollinating stores already within those verticals. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, that's not to say we don't play outside because outside, how it works is that we make investments based purely on investment case thesis. So it doesn't matter what kind of category the store is in. If it looks like we can make operational improvements uh, and grow the store, we will invest. So the only categories where that does not hold true in vice so sex drugs weapons stuff like mm -hmm. this that's really hard to uh, i would say normally advertise so on meta or, or any other platforms that's mm -hmm. where we have and even including cbd right i mean cbd now is is a category where you have such high cltv to tax because customers if they find the brand they will keep repeat uh, repeat purchasing they love where they get their cbd from um, but it's just really really hard to advertise in terms of the legal complexities and beauty very similar so one of our strategies for the brands when we acquire them is to internationalize them mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds so extremely simple just bringing the product in front of more people um, but especially in europe right you have all these different borders and each regulation for each country is slightly different and so the the issue with beauty products for us um, is that you know the product liability issues and the regulatory certifications that we have to do per country per border um, yeah is always something that I mean, makes it a little bit harder than it needs to be yeah. No, I, don't get me wrong. I sold my beauty business. I've not done beauty now for about 18 months, coming up for two years. Um, whether I would get back into beauty would be an interesting question. Um, but it's, I, I get what you're saying about beauty. And for me, beauty is insanely competitive. I mean, probably one of the most competitive markets I've ever seen. Um, I mean, the health supplement space is actually quite competitive. Are there any spaces that aren't competitive these days? I don't, maybe weighted blankets. <laughs> Even then, I imagine there's a lot of competition. Um, would you get I, back into the beauty game? Would I get back into the beauty game? I think I would. Um, because I think, well, I wouldn't do beauty the way that I did it. Uh, because I, I think um, that's part of the reason we got out of it. Um, and part of the reason we sold. I just thought my time in that industry had ended. Um, if that makes sense. And there were people that were better, smarter and cleverer than me that could take it on to the next phase. Um, but I think if it was the right product, the right approach, yeah, I think I'd probably be interested in it just because we know the market and, um, you know, what is it? 120% of females buy beauty products. Or <laughs> I mean, there's some crazy statistic um, and it's also a growing market amongst men now. So, um, but super competitive. So yeah, I, I think I probably would, but I think I would have some, uh, I'd have to have a very good reason to do that, Fabio. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, but I, I think it led me to an even you know, more important point, which is also what you said in terms of what stores you would start. So something where you kind of build a community that re-engages with the product. Mm -hmm. I think when you're looking at bigger deals, so in, in deals that are, or, or companies that are doing above 5 million a year in sales, that's definitely something you see, right? You see yeah. something where they're focusing on retention, uh, very, very obviously so, but at the deal sizes that we're looking at, right, we're buying stores that are doing anywhere from 500K a year to, to a couple of million. That's not so much of a factor there. Uh, it's a lot mm -hmm. of stores that are just focusing on one-time purchases. So we call them yeah. open stores where customers don't really subscribe, they don't ever come back, but it's really about that that first time AOV. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, by, by saying, hey, we're only gonna play in, in spaces where you have subscription products or you have a community that consistently re-engages, 
it really narrows the scope by so much because if a store is doing that, it wouldn't really be in that long tail per se. Yeah. That's a really interesting point because I, again, I was chatting to someone about this here. I mean, we have lots of conversations, as you can imagine, uh, around <laughs> e-commerce. Um, one of the things that I think we do particularly well as a business is uh, we are very good at helping customers buy from, from us a second time. So I'd be really interested in buying a company that didn't have a strong repeat customer base, but I thought it could have because that's where I'd be like, I think that would be where we could add some insane value and get some really quick wins. Um, so I, I, I get why you're looking at that, you know, that whole repeat purchase um, community side of things. But it's, it's interesting you give this sort of, is, so have you discovered then there's a turnover level, there's sort of like a sales level and the higher the turnover, the more likely there is to be this engaged community that buys time and time again. I don't know if there's um, there's a strict correlation per se, but I noticed that you know when we were doing our smaller deals, um, you see a lot more equipment stores. Uh, when we were doing the bigger ones, there tends to be a higher customer lifetime accretion. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of regardless of what category they're in. Uh, we noticed that when you're growing, you really have to focus on retention because it's mm. it's just and it just sounds so obvious, but it's just so much more profitable to focus on keeping the customers than to acquire new ones, especially especially in today's climate, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but there's so many businesses that just simply don't do it, um, mm. and it's it's not always a wrong, right? If you're doing 500k a year in sales, yeah, your biggest value lever probably isn't going to be to retain the customers that you have. It's probably going to be to acquire new customers or mm. to really rethink how you're approaching those customers. So what are some, I mean, you, you, we're talking about a vast array of, of businesses here. What are some of the things, the key factors then that you guys consider when valuing a Shopify business? Um, what, I, so I guess if I'm, if I'm listening to the show, I'm thinking, Fabio, if I'm listening to the show um, and I'm thinking of selling my business, what is interesting to you? And also, if people listening to the show might be like me going, I'm really interested in buying a few businesses. Um, again, what's interesting to you will become interesting to me. So I'm really kind of curious, what are some of the key factors that you guys look at? I can tell you a little bit about how our models work um, mm -hmm. because that's, that's always the first question we get because we don't do multiple base valuation. We do it from the inside out. And so okay. it's, it's always a bit of a question like, is that a big black box? Is there any color into, into how it works? Um, and, and there is. So we use two models, very simply put. So as I said, some of us came from the finance background. Uh, very short. We, were, we didn't spend so long there, but uh, <laughs> the first few acquisitions that we that we did, we did on a multiple base valuation methodology. And so yeah. we acquired three businesses in the span of a month, acquired them all with just simply putting our finger in the air and kind of waiting for a multiple to get on it. Uh, and so we very quickly realized that that's probably not the best way to value these DTC stores. And so mm -hmm. we had this, you know, we all claim to have this very smart team of techies and why could we not make it more of a science? Uh, and so we spent months developing this kind of inside out valuation methodology. So we pull directly from the stores and it basically runs through two models. So the first is what we call the customer behavior model, predicting mm -hmm. how customers behave. So it's, it's a known fact that depending on how and when you acquire customers, um, they have different lifetime values, right? If you acquire a bunch of, of customers when you're discounting heavily during Q4 gifting season, uh, these customers are not always going to be worth as much as you know, the run rate customers that you acquire. Sure. And so um, that's one thing that our customer or that that model focuses on. The second model that we kind of intertwine with that model is the customer acquisition cost model. So we see that every store at some point kind of hits a plateau at point where their next customer starts getting more expensive than the previous customer. And that's obviously not a point that's ideal for an individual merchant to sit at because it's, yeah, it's, it's simply unprofitable or not as profitable as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and the second is they want to kind of break through that ceiling and, and reach the new kind of scaling curve. So that's the second analysis we run. And we look at if we could make some operational improvements to the business. So be that CRO, be that uh, changing some levers in the ad account, be that targeting a new audience. What would that customer acquisition curve look like? We marry those two models and we get a good idea of how customers spend. So in, in reality, what that means is we get super excited about a business um, that has customers come back. So not just on a subscription model, has them come back at any point. 
We even look at businesses where there's no real reason for them to come back, but they come back after seven months. And there's no real reason because the products, they don't deteriorate, the products are good. But we just saw uh, a strange time frame that customers like to come back, not six, not 12 months, but seven months in. And so these for us are great signs that that business has found a great product market fit, has found a community that people, uh, of people that love the product. And that's for us the number one thing. In terms of specific ratios, we look at KPIs, there's not really anything. We look for the stores to be profitable before mm. factoring in any other costs. So before factoring in salaries, uh, cars, software that you might use, if it's profitable on that level, which I mean, uh, hopefully it, it should be, uh, that's fine for us. So we're really, really agnostic in terms of what we look for. So do you, um, when you, uh, well, Firstly, that's fascinating. I, I like how you're trying to predict how customers are going to behave and understand the different customers. Because you're right, someone that's coming from Black Friday is not going to be as valuable maybe as... Um, and so you've, you've got some clever way of sort of distinguishing those, uh, those customers and pulling that out of the data and understanding that with your customer acquisition costs. Okay, I can, st I can start to get my head around that. Um, because you're right, I've always... In some respects, I've always struggled with the multiple. I, I realized when we were selling our beauty business that if I sold my beauty business on the basis of a traditional multiple, it would be worth X. Um, you take the net profit, you times it by, or your EBITDA or whatever, you know, whatever number it was, and you would times it by a certain value, and there's the value of the business plus cash at the bank plus stock. It was a very crude cal calculation, but I... I realized when it came to selling the business, that actually the, the business, the value of the business is not that straightforward because if, let's say you guys bought it, you buy the business, well, does that mean you're gonna have to have take with you all of the staff, for example, and the premises and lease all of that to carry that on? Does that business have to run like that? Or are you a similar business to mine and you're not, you don't need the warehouse, you can just bring all the stock into your own warehouse, you've got your own distribution system, so there's most of the staff you're not gonna need. Um, well then the, the value is very different between one and the other, do you see what I mean? And so um, I, I get why you're not looking at, at, at the multiple aspect of it, um, because I, I do think it's quite a crude, a crude model. Um, so. Especially, especially on Shopify, right? I think, um, not to speak of, of any other e-com platforms, but comparing it to Amazon, there's so much more personality and, and nuances and intricacies that are built into a Shopify store where even if you're valuing, and we come across this, this quite often, right? We come across two businesses that are selling pretty much the identical product. I mean, they yeah. both source it from, from different suppliers, but end of the day, it's, it's more or less the same thing. But these businesses themselves have so many different things, even if they had similar profit margins, so many different levers that change the valuation of the business and us just saying, hey, currently we're seeing three and a half times is, is the market standard in terms of multiples. It just misses out too much uh, yeah. in terms of the business. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. It's um, when, you're, when you're buying a business then, Fabio, are you, are you, are you buying the business? Are you buying the shares in the company? You're taking everything on lock, stock and barrel or are you buying the assets of the business and integrating them over? You're not necessarily bringing the staff or is it a combination of the two? I'm just kind of curious as to what you do once you've acquired the business. Yeah, so we, we acquire only the assets. So we do asset deals, which to our model is, is fundamental because we're able to move much quicker. Asset deals get done generally a bit quicker than, than share deals. The due diligence required is much less. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we focus mostly on asset deals. Now, there are some jurisdictions in which asset deals are significantly less attractive to a seller than, than a share deal, um, mm. the UK being one, for example. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. We, are, we are a little bit flexible in terms of how we look at deals. Let's say that there's a big deal coming in and the seller really isn't uh, flexible in terms of how the, you know, the deal structure, that's something that we're willing to change, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of average run-of-the-mill deals that we do uh, every day, it's it's mostly asset deals. Mm. That's and sorry, to, to answer the second part of the question, we don't take over anything. So no employees, uh, we take over purely the Shopify stores, any other assets that might come with it, um, but no employees, no, and that, that's also something that is, you know, a little bit of a yellowish flag for us sometimes. If, if there are at this size, so at 500K to a few million a year, employees that are really, really key to running the business, it might make us double take a little bit of a, wow, 
maybe we should double think about if we really want to get into this business. Yeah. Okay. So the, um, and I guess from that, then you're, one of the things that you're looking at is, I think you mentioned it earlier, sort of operational cost savings. So by bringing a business into your, I'm going to use the word empire, but you know what I mean? It's probably the wrong word, but by bringing it into your, um, uh, your system there, you're, you're instantly making operational cost savings, right? Because you don't need a lot of those overheads. You've, you've already got them. They're already flowing out. So you can instantly see a cost saving there, but how do you manage it? If, um, and I'm just thinking again, if I went out and bought, um, if I went out and bought a business, um, I bought it into my warehouse, bought it, you know, I had my guys deal with it. Um, I get that there's an operational cost saving, but how do you deal with the voice? So, and what I mean by this is quite often sites, let's take a weighted blanket. Um, that website will have probably a founder and there'll be some kind of story associated with that. Um, the founder might be quite active on social media. There might be, do you see what I mean? That there, there might be a, the brand might contain that person um, a little bit more. So is that what you mean when you say that's a red flag for us, we don't get involved? Um, but I'm, I'm kind of curious if you do get involved, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so it depends to what degree the founder is really operationally involved or an employee for that matter. Um, and I mean, we like to call it our umbrella, but we can use empire. Uh, so when we... <laughs> when it's we, a when much we, better phrase, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, when we take stories over, we look at how involved or during the DD phase as well and before, we seek to double check how much that founder was involved. And so this way to blankets companies is a great example. The two founders were involved um, to what extent they were saying, you know, this helps improve sleep, this decreases anxiety. And they were really kind of, you know, the two faces that showed up on the website. But on our DD and our findings, it said that buyers were not really buying it because of these two faces. They were buying it because of the product. They were buying it because of the studies conducted on the blankets, not mm -hmm. because of the two faces. And so when we're able to really put um, or take apart the founder and the business, that's for us a very clear investment case. When there are um, other brands, and, and we've seen quite a few, right, where uh, Love Island, for example, right, Love Island, a lot of these these stars, they have their own Shopify stores and they sell, they use their face to sell, whatever it is, yeah. jewelry or, or something else. Those are much harder for us to play in. And we, and we haven't bought a single one of those yeah. brands purely because it's, I mean, none of us have that face, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> so how do you, do you... If when you take over a business and let's say a business has a particular brand voice um, that they've used over time. So it's not necessarily a face, but it's more of a voice. Do you try very hard to maintain that voice or or do you have like um, an empire voice <laughs> that that you use across all and you're, you're trying to get everything more towards this one singular voice because that's easier and everyone can cope with that. I, I, I don't know if you thought that through. I don't know if that's a long term strategy. I'm just kind of curious how you deal with it. No, it is. It is. It's something that we think about. So um, full transparency, the first three stores that we ever acquired, uh, so two are in the US, um, of which one was the poop bags and one was a gaming brand. That was actually the first mistake that we made. We had this whole like theoretical knowledge of this standard operations like playbook that everyone should follow, that every DTC store should follow and they shouldn't deviate it from it because then you're not doing something right. And mm -hmm. so we bought those stores, immediately applied the playbook and I mean, the performance just really went down. And so we were, we were right. wondering like, what are, what are we doing wrong? We have all the theoretical knowledge and that's when we really made a big shift and every acquisition afterwards, we run very much like the owner. Yes, we make improvements. Yes, we'll make, uh, we'll change the landing pages. We'll make them look a little bit better, but we run them in the same voice that the owner has. And so again, if the, if that voice is something very active, the owner has to be on podcasts, newsletters, things like that. Maybe it's not the best business to integrate and to, to operate. But if it's a voice where, um, let's take the dog poop bag thing, for example, where it really focuses on sustainability, focuses on the fact that this is the most environmentally friendly solution. Yes, they might be a little bit more expensive, but it, it gets made up for the environmental impact, right? Um, while there might be so many other angles, there might be another angle to say, hey, focus on the ease of this, that it just gets delivered to your doorstep every 30 days. Um, we really chose just to focus on that sustainability angle because of course the founder has a reason for why they're using that voice. They're not just using it randomly. Uh, and the most naive thing for us to do would be to say, hey, 
amazing. You ran this business for two years and now we're going to completely change the voice, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also never the plan. We never want to destroy the brand equity of these brands and roll them, for example, into say, let's say every storage shop and sell all the products under our, our name. That's, that's not really the plan. Okay. But do you, um, do you tie in the owner of the business in some way once you've purchased the assets of the business? Um, for example, when we sold the beauty business, I was not allowed to go back into beauty for two years. I had to be careful with um, what kind of coaching we did as a, you know, what kind of fulfillment we did as a company who, there, there was all kinds of things put on us. And also, um, and to be fair to the person, the company that bought it, I mean, they've been amazing uh, and we've had a great relationship. Um, they wanted to retain me as part of the deal, they're like, we just want to be able to call you up at some point and ask you a whole bunch of questions. Um, almost like a consultant type role, but um, not that that's ever actually happened thinking about, I mean, no, to be fair, they've called me once, twice, but nothing massive, nothing major. So do you find then that once you've purchased a business, the, the owner is, I'm going to use a phrase free to go. It does sound a little bit like they've escaped from jail, but do you know what I mean? It's like kind of, um, or is there, is there some kind of tie-in that you have with the owner? Yeah, um, so there isn't. And that's that's part of the reasons of every story is that whole like reliable, simple, uh, sorry, simple exit liquidity kind mm -hmm. of gets thrown away if you have an earnout or you require them to stay afterwards. And so principally, none of our deals have earnouts. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we will also not go to that model. Um, how it happens is that, you know, the second you sign the contract, we wire 70% of the money, then there is a integration period so depending really on the complexity of the business, but normally it's around two months. Um, but there's no real input required from the owner. So it's more about our ad teams will then start running the ads. They will start maybe changing the creatives, that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and the whole integration period is there not only just to receive the inventory, but also to say, hey, um, we're sending an email every week to say, hey, this is what we did this week. And actually it didn't work out, right? We tried this new angle, didn't work out. Do you have any thoughts on why this might be? And so to really go into much less of an active role and much more of a passive role for the owner. And okay. when that period is done, they're fully able to move on in, in terms right. of you know competitive requirements, like you said, with you know, that's it starting beauty. Yeah, uh, if we buy a gaming brand that makes gaming skins, we, we put in the contract that the, the founder is not able to do another gaming skin store, but they're generally not very broad. So if they do something in the mental, mental wellness, mental health space, it's not about not doing another thing in the mental health space. It's more about not doing the exact same thing that we bought from you. Yeah, so yeah. weighted blanket, not another weighted blanket. You can start linens, you can start duvets, whatever, but not weighted blankets Yeah, for two yeah. years. Two years seems to be the standard protocol. Two years, that's yeah. it. You know, and it, I don't know whether that's a, a, a just sort of an unwritten spoken rule of reasonableness. Maybe I don't. I don't know what that is. I think it's a magic number that's just continually been passed down. <laughs> yeah, well, no one knows where it's come from or why. Um, yeah, there's there's a number of those numbers we have in our lives, isn't there? Um, well, this has been fascinating, Fabio. I mean, I've got so many questions about how you guys do it from a process, not because I necessarily want to sell, but because I'm interested in acquisition, you know, and so super curious to see how your dashboard works when it comes out. So when it does, do let me know, because I, I, I do want to see it. Um, but enough about me uh, and what I want to do, Fabio. Let's go back to the merchants, right? So what are some of the common mistakes you've seen uh, owners make when they're looking to sell their business and how can they avoid them? Yeah, number one is not running the business while you're focusing on the exit. And it sounds so incredibly simple, but it's we see it happen so often. And so it's actually when you go through the process with us, there's a big yellow box with red font that says, don't stop running your business until the deal is complete. So no matter if we do the, we, we always seek to do the deal. If we go through the D, we want to do the deal. Um, but regardless of whether you do it with us or with someone else, don't ever stop running the business because what happens uh, is that someone will drop out and then you have to now restart that business from two weeks of spending nothing on ads, right? And there's yeah. nothing worse to come back to than that. So yeah. the, the top thing that we say is, even if you're preparing for an exit, don't take it for granted until you've signed the paper. Um, yeah. I mean, we always say that, we want to make the deal as soon as we enter the contract. But even with us, like it's just unilateral advice. Please don't ever assume that it's concrete until you sign. Um, in terms of anything else, I would say focusing too much on, on crafting a story around what the buyer can do with the business. 
Um, there's so many times when we look at, you know, we kind of get pitched by the merchant in terms of what we can do. The same way that we never pitch them for a sale. We're here if they want to sell, uh, we're not pressuring them and we will always be there for a sale. But the same thing with, with making reasons for the buyer. I think if you have a reasonably sophisticated buyer that knows what they want to do with the brand, there's no real need for you to come up with reasons. And I think that if the buyer is consistently asking you, hey, what are the value levers that we can pull here mm. in this brand? And they keep asking, even though they've already done the DD, it's probably a sign that it's not the best buyer out there for you. Yeah, no, that's fair play. That's fair play. So, <laughs> I'm just I'm just trying to filter through the 20,000 questions that are in my head at the same time. <laughs> um, and I'm also aware of time. So let me, let me uh, ask you the question I ask everybody, Fabio. Let's go down that road. Uh, as you know, this show is sponsored by e-commerce cohort, which helps businesses deliver e-commerce well to their company, uh, to their customers through coaching and training. So I want you to imagine, right, you're in a room full of cohort members uh, and you've just delivered a keynote speech all about how to acquire businesses. Uh, and they stand up and they're just like, well, yeah, you go, Fabio. Best speech you've ever done. Um, <laughs> And you get a few moments just to go, you know what, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for dot, dot, dot. Um, and you've got a few minutes to thank those who have had an influence on your own e-commerce journey. I'm kind of curious, who would you who would you thank and why? And it can be anybody from family, mentors, authors, software, podcasters, you name it. But who's on your list and why? That's a very good question. I think it's, it's twofold. Uh, so one is these, I think, you know, it's probably very well known, like five years ago, when you were looking at e-commerce, every other ad I would get on my YouTube, we've got like passive income, drop shipping, hustle, that kind of stuff, right? These like traditional kind of like scammy things. And, mm -hmm. uh, I never really followed in, in those footsteps, but that for the first time ever brought awareness to Shopify. And that's been a foundational part to, I mean, how Eversource has grown. And so, uh, one, I would like to thank all those people, even if they're selling courses. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, and, and second, that the founding team of Everstores and also the partners that we are with in, in, in the environment, so 3PLs, the agencies we speak to, these are incredibly smart people who have more than anything really figured out what the merchant struggles with the most. And we approach that very similarly. So we don't approach it with the fact, hey, we're going to make a return on this asset. The first principle that we have in mind is how can we make the merchant's life easier now mm. um and i think that's that's a kind of like framework of thinking that has been passed through to me not only by the founders of every stores but also by the you know three pls agencies we work with that's mm -hmm. no, fantastic fantastic how about yourself oh uh no one's ever asked me that question <laughs> uh who would i thank and why um i think there's a guy called chris <clears throat> Uh, and I can't remember his surname. I just remember he was, when we did our first ever e-commerce business, we ended up buying products from a guy called Chris at a company called Bliss, who um, he was really flexible while I was figuring out computer code. And I just said, I'm just gonna, this was back in 2002. I'm like, I'm just gonna, I don't know. I don't know how it works, this whole online selling thing, but can I sell your products? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I said, I'm just gonna order them as and when I sell them because I've not got enough money to buy stock. And he was like, fine, no problem. Um, and um, we set up that business and he ended up buying it from us six months later. Um, and that sort of, yeah, that was that was me starting out and getting the bug, I think, um, with, uh, with all things online. So yeah, it's been a fascinating journey. I mean, there's so many people I'd think, like the whole team that works with me uh, at Orion who are just absolute legends. My business partner in the beauty industry, Andy, he was top bloke. Um, so yeah, I've <laughs> the trouble is I've not got enough time to list them all, uh, Fabio. But um, yes, my wife, my kids, you know. <laughs> so Fabio, listen, it's been an absolute joy, honestly, man. Uh, it's been really interesting talking to you, and um, I'm sure that there are people out there listening who are going, yeah, I've got some more questions. So how do people reach you? How do they connect with you if they want to do that? So principally through the website, I'm available at LinkedIn and Fabio Savvy. Uh, it's also my email address, so fabio.savvy at eversource.com. But on the website, if you go there, it should be super, I mean, we tried to design it to be super intuitive. Uh, there's also a little button with my face on it. So if you press there, you get a direct link to my, uh, <laughs> to my chat account. But uh, yeah, that's how you find me. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we will, of course, link to Fabio's info in the show notes, which, as I mentioned at the start, you can get along for free, uh, along with the transcript at ecommercepodcast.net. They will also come straight to your inbox if you've signed up for our newsletter. Fabio, listen, man, brilliant conversation. Uh, Really enjoyed it. It's a shame time has got away from me in some respects. Um, But thanks for coming on to the e-commerce podcast. You've been an absolute legend. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's been great. It's been great. So there you have it. What a great conversation. A huge thanks again to Fabio for joining me today. Also, a big shout out to today's show sponsor, the e-commerce cohort. Now, remember to check out their free training online at ecommercecycles.com. Yes, it is free. Also, be sure to follow the e-commerce podcast wherever you get your podcast from, because we've got yet more great conversations lined up and we don't want you to miss any of them. And before I wrap up today's episode, let me take a moment to invite you, dear listener, to become a part of the show. Yes, If you're an e-commerce entrepreneur or an expert uh, and would like to share your insights with our audience, just like Fabio, uh, well, we'd love to hear from you. Or if you know someone that would make a great guest, send them our way. Just head over to the ecommercepodcast.net website and get in touch. We're always looking for fresh perspectives and new ideas, so don't be shy. Whether you're just starting out or have years of experience under your belt, we'd love to hear from you. So that's it from me. Oh, no, actually, I've, I've got one last thing. In case no one's told you yet today, you are awesome. How can I forget that bit? You are created awesome. It's just a burden you have to bear. I've got to bear it. Fabio's got to bear it. And you've got to bear it as well. The e-commerce podcast is produced by Orion Media. You can find our entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app. The team that makes this show possible is Sadaf Bainon, Estella Robin, and Tanya Hutzelak. Our theme song is written by Josh Edmondson. And as I mentioned, if you would like to read the transcript or show notes, you can find them on the website ecommercepodcast.net, where coincidentally you can sign up for the newsletter. Now that's it from me. That's it from Fabio. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic week wherever you are in the world. I will see you next time. Bye for now.